Amen. Well, good morning. Good to see each one of you here today. It's Labor Day weekend, so we say happy Labor Day weekend. And I'm just encouraged that you're here today. I know a lot of people are traveling, and uh, so we are so excited that you're here. Uh, we welcome our online campus. We have an online pastor, Pastor Anna, who's there to answer any questions, to pray with you uh, throughout your experience. And we're so glad you're here with us as well. And uh, man, I'm just so thankful for the presence of God and the way God is moving, what God is doing. And uh, I just want to say that um, uh, we talked a little bit about um, Enough Conference on, on the screen, but I don't know if you know, but Crystal Evans Hurst is actually Dr. Tony Evans' daughter. And uh, just a great lineup of speakers and ministers and ladies. Encourage you to, to get your tickets as soon as possible. We want to see this place just packed full of ladies worshiping and lifting up Jesus together, doing a work in your heart, just like God did a couple weeks ago in our Bold Venture, uh, our men's conference. But we, again, are glad um, that uh, we have the opportunity to have this great event. Um, also want to mention to you, it was mentioned, but... Um, this Saturday is something called Starting Your Journey. So if you are new to Sioux Falls First, you're new to your faith, or maybe you just want to refresh your course, um, we invite you to sign up um, at SiouxFallsFirst.com under register. You can register and sign up there for Starting Your Journey. Um, but it's an opportunity for us to gather together here at uh, 9 in the morning. We start with a continental breakfast. And then our staff takes turns walking through what um, our church is all about, our mission, our values. And, uh, and then we do a, a full lunch for you. And then we have you out by 3 o'clock. Um, but it's just an amazing time. We get to know new people. And uh, it's also the path to membership. And so if you're interested in membership, some have asked, um, that's the path to membership. And so we encourage you uh, to sign up today for this Saturday, 9 to 3, starting your journey. So if you have your Bibles or devices, would you turn to the book of Exodus, the second book in the Bible, uh, chapter 14, and uh, we're going to be hanging in 14 and 13, and I really believe the Lord has a word for us today. I'm encouraged, I'm on the edge of my seat to deliver it, because I know that God wants to do something in your life, uh, whether you're here in this room or you're watching online, I believe the Lord's going to deposit some things in you. I encourage you to take notes. There's an amazing testimony um, you're going to hear at the end of this message. And every week we talked about this. We're going to preach the word, and we know that uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And uh, then we're going to give you opportunity to be prayed for. Maybe you're here today because somebody invited you. Maybe you need a miracle. Maybe you're online, you need a miracle. I believe God's going to show up. Man, I have a confidence in who he is. And as we read through and study scripture, I believe that revelation is gonna come to you as well. And, um, and then if, if, you, if you experience a miracle, we wanna hear about it. We want you to reach out to us, call the office, um, because we want the opportunity to hear what God is doing because we wanna be faithful to proclaim that. Amen? Faithful to proclaim that because your testimony can be a prophetic picture in somebody else's life. Like they're gonna say, oh man, if God did that for them, God can do something for me too, amen? Would you pray with me? Father, we love you. We thank you for this day that you've given us. This is the day the Lord has made and we rejoice and we will be glad in it. God, I thank you that we're able to gather together whether we're in this room or we're watching online and I thank you that you, God, today wanna speak to us. God, not just corporately, but you wanna speak to us personally. So I pray that this word would be personal for each one of us. Father God, I pray for those that are here today, those that maybe couldn't be here today, Lord, that, that need a miracle. We believe that we are entering into a season of the supernatural. And Father God, we believe as we see the, the miracles of God and see you intervene, that it's going to draw people to Jesus. They're going to have a revelation of the Son of God and, and the glorious price you paid for our salvation. I pray that you would move in the hearts of people today. We surrender to your lead. We follow you. God, move in this room. Move across this building. Move across our online campus. Have your way today. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. Amen, amen. amen. Just encourage you, if you're watching online, to share your feed as well, because we know that's how um, others can receive maybe what God wants to do in their life as well. But I just want to start off by congratulating uh, the Sioux Falls Little League team at their amazing fourth place finish in the Little League World Series. Amen? Isn't that a big deal? 
Actually, my neighbor Kai was on that baseball team, and man, I know it was a memorable year for them. It's always disappointing to lose, but to be fourth place in the world is a pretty big deal. But as I was watching them, kind of reminded me of when I played Little League Baseball. Man, I, I love playing baseball. It's the only sport I really played as a, as a youngster growing up. And, uh, but to be honest with you, I, I wasn't the best player. I wasn't the fastest player, but I loved to play. In fact, there were moments where um, I would get on base, and, and most of the time I got on base because I was either walked or hit by a pitch. In fact, they had to teach me to stay in the batter's box. And I said, the batter's box is not a safe place to be. I was so short, they had a hard time finding the strike zone, that I walked all the time. Either that or, again, they hit me with a pitch. But I'll never forget, there were times where I was on base and, and, and the person hit the ball. One of my teammates hit the ball and I took off from that base and, and I kind of got in between this, this, uh, these two basemen who were throwing the ball back and forth until they eventually tagged me out. It's called being in a pickle. No place to go. And so today as we continue our God of the Miracles series, we're gonna talk about a time when the nation of Israel found themselves in a similar situation. They were in a pickle. In fact, uh, I wanna begin with a little background information to give context to what we're gonna be talking about the next few moments. But God had heard the cries of the nation of Israel because they had been in Egyptian slavery for 430 years. And God responding to their prayer tapped on the shoulder of a man by the name of Moses. He spoke to him out of a burning bush and told him, you are the guy to lead the nation of Israel out of bondage. And we know what happened, that Moses kind of was uh, arguing with God. He had this lengthy discussion. He, he gave every excuse in the book of why he wasn't the one. But after a season of time, he finally reluctantly obliged. Moses responding to what God had spoke to him. And yet Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, didn't take it well. He refused to let the nation of Israel go until God sent 10 plagues on the Egyptians that brought great devastation. Finally, after the 10th plague in which every firstborn Egyptian was killed, Pharaoh finally told them to leave. And as they left, as they exited Egypt, it's amazing that they were able to take with them silver and gold and clothing and jewelry as they completely plundered the Egyptians. And yet as these one over one million Israelites were exiting, the Lord led them, the Bible says, with a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night because God always reveals his presence. But he, he didn't lead them the easy way, he led them the long route that began with a 40-year journey that initially required a miracle, the parting of the Red Sea. So I want you to read with me Exodus chapter 14, beginning at verse 1, and we're going to read down through verse 12. It says, And the Lord said to Moses, Tell the people of Israel, to turn back and encamp in front of Pi Haruth, between Migdal and the sea, in front of Balsaphon. You shall encamp facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, they're wandering in the land, the wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed toward the people. And they said, what is this we have done, that we've let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his army with him and took 600 chosen chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. 
And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. Then the Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army and overtook, overtook them and camped at the sea by Paharuth in front of Val Savon. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them. And they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we've said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. So here's the scenario. The Egyptian army pursuing this nation of Israel as they were exiting Egypt. They don't get very far when they realize in front of them is the Red Sea. So this great throng of people that found themselves literally trapped. They were in a pickle. They had no place to go. Fear began to rise up in their hearts as they began to say to Moses, it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than die in the wilderness. And I just want to stop here. Isn't it amazing what crisis will do to our perspective when our focus is wrong. They were focused on the wrong thing. And all of a sudden, this God who sent the plagues and delivered them out of Egypt was a God that couldn't help them now. Because they were in a crisis, they were in a pickle, and their, their perspective was completely wrong. And yet God saw it all, and he knew what he was doing. And so what do we gather from this epic story about the God of miracles. The first thing I believe we learn is that sometimes the miracle is keeping us from things we never see. I want you to turn back to chapter 13, and I'm just gonna read two verses. Verse 17 and 18, it says, when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near or close, for God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. But God led the people around by the way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea, and the people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt equipped for battle. So there's one thing in getting people out of Egypt, but it's a whole other thing getting Egypt out of people. And we know that as he was leading them out of Egypt, God strategically led them not the easy route. In fact, from where they were to the land of Canaan, it would have only taken them about a week. They would have been there in a week. But because of the circumstances and because God saw things they didn't see, he took them the longer route. In his omniscience, God knew that the nation of Israel, if they went by the Philistines, they would see war, they would see conflict, and they would change their minds and want to go back to slavery, return to Egypt. But because God redirected them, they never experienced it. Here's what I've learned throughout the years of my life, that sometimes the miracle is keeping us from things that we would have experienced if God wouldn't have prevented it. Let's be honest, we like to see the visual miracles. Man, we, we like to see blinded eyes open and lame people walk and, and, and people raised from the dead. We, we love those miracles, I know I do. But so many times, God produces miracles in a way that we can't see them. In preventing us from experiencing things that we could have experienced. So many times, God performs the non-visual miracles that we never see. You see, God often provides miraculous protection from unseen dangers that we'll never know about. And I've shared this story before, but it made an indelible impression on me. Back when I was 13 years old, I, I had a paper out. It was my first job. I delivered about 55 to 60 papers 
to my community of 300 people. Everybody knew everybody. I loved it because I got to connect with all these people in our, in our community. And uh, when I was 13 and delivering papers, it was right around the time that uh, Johnny Gosh, one of the paper carriers in Des Moines, Iowa, was abducted. And it was big news. During that time, uh, you remember all the, the faces of people on milk cartons, and, and a lot of them were paper carriers. And what I would do is every day I would deliver papers after school, but on Saturday and Sunday, I would get up real early before, while it was still dark, and I would deliver my papers, and then I would get home and go back to bed while it was still dark. And so it worked out really well. I got to sleep in on Saturday after I delivered my papers on Saturday. And then I was able to go to church first service on Sunday because I had my papers delivered and I could get ready and still go to church. And on one particular Saturday, I got up early that morning and I always count my papers to make sure I have enough. And I put them in the, in the basket of my bike. And I started to ride my bike to go deliver the papers that morning when it was still dark and the street lights were still on. And, and I saw this uh, brown van that was kind of on the side of the road. It was out of place, but I really didn't think about it that much. And my dad, who hadn't been saved very long, hadn't returned back to Christ very long, but he felt this impression that I was in danger. And so he called my mother and said, I really feel Quentin's in danger today and you, you need to find out where he's at. And I wasn't very far from the house, but again, there was this, this brown van on the side of the road and, and all of a sudden I hear my mom yell my name. I stop, I turn around, I kind of make a U-turn and as soon as I did, the lights on that van lit up and that, that van drove away. And, and I believe with all of my heart, God using the spiritual gifts kept me from something that day that I didn't have to see. And even though I was blind to it, even though I didn't know what was going on, God saw everything that was going on and tapped on the shoulder of my father to call my mom to make sure nothing happened to me. That's who God is. You see, you and I will never fully know what God has kept us from. Even though we've experienced some things, even though we've been through some trials and tribulations, we will never know what God kept us from. In fact, I love what it says in Psalm 34, 7. Uh, David reminds us the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Aren't you grateful for God's protection? Aren't you grateful for those moments that you thought you were experiencing man's rejection, but it was actually God's redirection because he saw things you couldn't see? Man, I'm so grateful that God's eyes are open and God sees it all. What's the second thing we learn from this story is that sometimes the Lord allows us into situations where human wisdom falls short. In fact, I want you to continue reading with me, Exodus 14. We'll pick it up at verse 13. And Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians, whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You only have to be silent. The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I'm the Lord, whom I've gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. You see, the nation of Israel was in a predicament. And no war strategy, no human solution was going to get them out of it. The ferocious Egyptian army was behind them. The Red Sea was in front of them. They were between a rock and a hard place. They were completely at loss in knowing what to do. In fact, if God didn't show up, the game was over. And maybe you can relate to that today. Maybe you can understand that thinking, God has to show up in order for us to get out of this. But I want you to look at the, the godly wisdom that was imparted by Moses when human wisdom fell short. Look what he says. He says, fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. 
He commanded them not to fear. He commanded them and instructed them to stand firm, regardless of what they were feeling. Regardless of what was going through their mind or their heart, regardless of the way the enemy was intimidating them, they were to stand firm and then he invited them to see, not with natural eyes, but with eyes of faith, the salvation of the Lord in which he said, he will work for you today. And here's what I've learned. So many times we see with natural eyes. So many times we see what only our physical eyes can see when God is wanting us to see something so much more. So many times all we see is earth when God's saying, I want you to see heaven come down on earth. In fact, he then told them, he said, uh, the Lord will work for you today. It reminds me of what Paul says in Romans 8, 28, one of my favorite passages. He says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. He didn't say everything was good. In fact, there's a whole lot of bad we experience. There's a whole lot of trials we experience. There's a whole lot of struggles and valleys and emotions and all all these different things we experience. And he didn't say all things were good. He said, God will work all things for good for you because you love him and you're called according to his purpose. In fact, part of receiving the miracle that God has for you and I is realizing that God is for you. If you can't start there, if you can't stand on that foundation of truth, then you're never going to be able to experience God's goodness in your life. We have to realize that God is for us. God is working on your behalf, even in the midst of your pickle. Even when you feel like there's no place to go, I'm stuck here. In fact, then Moses told him, he said, the Lord will fight for them. But notice what he added to that. He said, he will fight for you, only be silent. He said, you need to be quiet right now. Why? You know, he could have said, you need to lift up a shout of praise. You could have shouted. There were other times when he said that. But he said, this time I want you to be silent. Why? Because their words weren't contributing to the miracle God was wanting to bring. They were complaining. They were murmuring. Had a bad attitude. We want to go back to Egypt. And God finally had to say, would you just be quiet? I know what right now you're wanting to speak. I know right now you're wanting to complain. I know right now you're wanting to let fear come out of your mouth. But right now, be quiet. There's times when we got to quit talking. There's times when our emotions take over and we see what's behind us. We see it's in front of us. And we have to say, you know what? We're just not going to talk right now. We're not going to speak because the Bible tells us that out of our mouth we produce life or death. And, and so many times we don't contribute, we actually delineate from our miracle by not aligning with the word that God has already spoken over us. And last week we talked about the word of the Lord and the word of the Lord stands, God's word, God's truth stands above all circumstances. God always has the final word. Our words are extremely important. But then Moses said, then the Lord told Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. And some of you need to hear that today, whether you're watching online or you're in this room, because you have been frozen in fear. You have been paralyzed in your spiritual progress because of what you're facing right now. Maybe very personal, maybe, maybe even general, maybe national. We, we look at all these crazy, stupid things happening, and, 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 and unintentionally, it becomes our focus and we become stuck in anxiety, we become stuck in worry. And, and that's why the Lord says, Moses said, why, why, why keep talking? Move forward. He instructed him, take your staff and lift it over the sea and, and I'll take care of it, I'll show up. I'll demonstrate my salvation. And then I wanna, I wanna encourage you to read this later, but Exodus 14, 19 to 31, we see this amazing deliverance story. We see Moses do that, and the sea part, and the Bible says it became like two walls that they walked in the middle of. And the Bible says on dry ground, what even muddy? Aren't you grateful for the rain we've had? I'll put up with the mud, right? But they walked on dry ground. It says when they got to the other side, Moses picked up his staff again. And as, as the army was pursuing them, the Egyptian army was pursuing them, the Bible says they became confused and, and, and their, their wheels began to lock up and struggle getting through. And, and then the, as they all got in the middle, the, the waters came over and overtook them all. The Bible says every single one of them drowned. 
The Lord thoroughly defeated the enemy in the midst of that miracle. And it says that Israel saw the power of God and they, they revered him or they feared the Lord again. They lost that. And why was it important for them to understand who God was at that moment? Because they were just at the beginning of their 40 year journey to the promised land and they needed to know how to depend on the power of God. They weren't gonna do it in themselves. They weren't gonna provide for themselves. They weren't gonna see the glory of the glorious things that God wanted to do on their own. They needed to depend on the power of God. Here's the other thing. They'd been there 430 years. They'd been in slavery. They knew how to live like slaves. They needed to learn how to live like sons and daughters. And God was having to redirect their thinking. God was having to give them understanding of who, who he was. And I would say, isn't that the truth for all of us? Slaves look back and say, I need to go back. Sons and daughters say, you know what? I know who my God is. And I know what he's provided for me. We have a young lady by the name of Irina who was in a pickle and desperately needed to see the power of God. I want you to listen to her story. Hey, my name is Irina. Uh, I'm a mom of five children. I'm married to Dimitri Schinder, the love of my life. We've been married for 12 years now. And um, just last year in 2020, uh, we found out in May that we were pregnant um, it was in, right in the middle of Corona, and um, I was homeschooling my two sons. It was a really hard time. It was like scary. You didn't know what was going to happen. Like everything shut down, the mask mandate, and it was like a surprise pregnancy. It was very unexpected, and I was actually a little bit scared, which um, our other three, like we were filled with joy, but this one with everything going on with Corona, it was uh, very... Um, scary time. Once I started having ultrasounds, at first they told me it was um, two babies with two placentas. So it's a less, um, like it's not as high of a risk pregnancy. But once I went in for my 20 week ultrasound, they told me that it's actually um, one placenta and two babies. So they're identical and it's a lot higher risk pregnancy um, because of all the complications that come with having one placenta. And in the next ultrasound when I came in, um, normally they're super talkative when they're doing the ultrasound, but this time the lady didn't talk at all. Like she was super quiet and like I kept asking, is everything okay? And she wouldn't, she wouldn't talk to me. She's just like very quiet. And right away I got filled up with fear. So when the doctors came in um, uh, to tell me that there's something wrong with the girls, that they're not growing. And um, they told me we need to sch schedule uh, schedule an ultrasound to do on the heart and we need to schedule appointments to find out what's wrong with them. Uh, my husband and I, we left that ultrasound just like super sad and I started crying right away. I'm like, I didn't talk to my husband a lot. Like it was just a very sad ride home, you know? And I, right away, I should have been like filled with joy, but I wasn't, I was filled with fear. And I know fear is not from God, like God is not fear. So right away I came into my room, I closed the door behind me and like I just got on my knees. This is hard for me, it, it brings back emotions, I'm sorry. But like I just came before God and I started bringing verses that I read from the Bible that like God knows what I need. I just come to him believing and I start praying to God and I'm like, God, I wasn't trying to get pregnant and I'm scared to be a mom of five kids. Like I just came before God and I just told him what was on my heart. Like I just pleaded to God, like I told him, like, am I doing this mom thing right? Like, I just told him everything that's in my heart. And I started bringing verses that I memorized that I would write down before God, like, about prayer. And, like, that God knows what we need. We just need to come before him, and he'll hear us. And I started quoting those scriptures. And, like, once I got done from, um, from praying, I get up. And right away, the Holy Spirit tells me, you need to cancel those appointments. God does not make mistakes. And I was like... Huh. Like, is that, wow. Like, I was like, thank you, God. Like, that was fast response. Like, I felt at peace. 
for the next six weeks after they told me that they weren't growing properly, um, every single ultrasound I would go to, they were telling me something's wrong with them. They're very small, they're not on the chart. And every, like I dreaded going to ultrasounds because every time I'd go, I would leave crying. Like it, it was such a hard time like in my life to, from having three kids that are perfectly healthy to being pregnant with two. And every time I would go in, every week they were telling me something's wrong, something's wrong. And uh, at 29 weeks, everything that they were scanning me for like started getting worse. And baby B was showing signs that, um, that the blood was not uh, flowing cor correctly through uh, the, the umbilical cord. And they say once the blood stops flowing, that the baby dies within 24 hours. And they were saying that I'm starting to show signs that it's high level and that my pregnancy was getting uh, dangerous to continue on. And um, they're like, it's safer for us to induce your pregnancy than it is um, for you to continue. And we all gathered at my sister's house and we just had a prayer meeting over me and everybody prayed over me. They laid their hands on me. They prayed over me. Um, they, and I just started asking everybody to fast for me that week because I knew I was going to be going in on Monday to have them. And that same weekend we came to Sioux Falls first and um, um, when we were in church, like I really, um, in my heart, I had this desire to go get prayed for by Byron, and I really wanted to go get prayed for by him, and I don't know why, if it was the Holy Spirit telling me to go, but before they um, even announced for prayer, as soon as I seen him come up, I went down the balcony, and I found him, and I went to him before they even started praying. When I told him all this, he, he told me to raise uh, my hands up to God, and I did. Like, I was, I was giving it all to God. I knew it was out of my hands, but um, for six weeks from the time that they told me all of this, I was filled with so much fear. Like, I just walked around with this heaviness. Like, I was so scared for what my future was to hold. Even though God told me that God doesn't make mistakes, that they're from God, I still walked around with this heaviness. Like, I was so scared for what my future was to hold. But at the same time, my husband and I, we decided we're going to accept whatever God gives us. When he, he started praying over me and I got really hot, I felt very warm and like I was, I felt like I was shaking and he just starts praying over me and I felt really warm and after the prayer, um, I felt the depression just lift, it wasn't depression, it was anxiety just lift off of me. I got like such peace, like I knew everything was okay, like I was like, I know it's in God's hands, like all this worry that I walked around for six weeks, it was out of my hands, like it was in God's hands. The next day I w went in expecting to um, set my C-section for that week and um, they start doing the ultrasound and when the doctor comes in, he sits down and he's like, so um, everything that we've been seeing on the scans, we're not seeing, the babies are 50-50. I was like, huh. Uh, he's like, um, I don't know what happened, but they're completely and and now they're showing on the chart that they're at seven percent, which up to that point they've never been on the chart for measuring where they're supposed to be. And right away I go, praise God, He healed them. I knew He healed them because I had such peace. Like when God prayed, when I got prayed over, I had such peace. All the anxiety that I walked around for six weeks just lifted off of me. Like I knew God healed them. And I come back the next day for uh, the next ultrasound and perfectly fine. Like they don't find nothing. He's like, well, let's hope to make it to 32 weeks. And in my heart, I was like, no, I've been praying to God to make it to 35 weeks. And so the doctor's like, well, let's just see how it goes week by week. So they start having me come in every week and every week, nothing, perfectly fine, growing. Every every sign that they were saying, like the first six weeks, um, for the next six weeks, uh, every single ultrasound I had was good. And it was like for every six weeks that they told me something bad, God kept them in for six weeks, speaking something good about them. And even though they set my appointment to get scheduled at 34 weeks, I knew I was gonna deliver at 35 weeks because I knew God listened to my prayer. I knew he heard me, like he heard the prayers because God's a good God, he cares. 
like he knows what you want. You just gotta ask him, like God wants good for you. And um, at 34 weeks, I had all my pack, all my bags packed to go in to have the babies. And uh, two hours before we're supposed to go in, I get a phone call saying that, please come back a, a, on Saturday night because they are short staffed because of Corona. And the, day, the new date that they had set was exactly 35 weeks. How I kept praying my whole pregnancy that I would make when I wasn't even supposed to make it to 30 weeks. So um, we had the girls at 35 weeks naturally. They came out um, so healthy, so strong. Uh, and the first thing that the, um, the NICU said, they, they went to the NICU for two weeks because they were premature by two weeks, but they completely were healthy, nothing was wrong. The first thing they said to me is, I don't know what they were talking about, they had no growth restrictions, and it's all glory to God, like God is such a good God, and it's such a testimony. Every time I tell people this, I just like burst out in tears because I can't believe like it was such a hard pregnancy. And then for every six weeks that they would say something bad, God kept them in for six weeks saying something good. Like I've seen the, the power of God and like through prayer, like prayer is so important. Like, and I knew anxiety was not from God. Like, so anytime I would go through that, I would come to God and I'd bring scripture that I would write down that I didn't know that anytime I would pray, I would like say those scriptures to God because then I, like when I'm quoting it from the Bible, it's the living word of God. Like it's the living word. So anytime when I had trouble, I would go to my scriptures that like would just bring me peace. And it did, it helped me through the hardest time in my life. And the babe, our twins, like perfectly healthy. They went home within two weeks, like all glory to God. They're meeting every milestone, like faster than, they're perfectly healthy. And they're such a blessing that we didn't even know we were missing. Like it's such, like our family's complete. And all because God doesn't make mistakes. He knew what we needed that before we even knew. And it's all glory to God. I believe that my God is a God of miracles, and God did it for me, and he can do it for you, too. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Church, would like to ask you to stand to your feet. Hallelujah. Slava Bogu. Glory to God. All glory to him. Thank you, Jesus. Let me just say this, I think it's a lot, of, a lot of good things in that testimony. But one of the things that I really wanna highlight is that how when she was facing the struggles and the difficulties, how they pressed into God. And God spoke some things to them personally that God may not speak to the other person. And it's important when we're going through something, when we're needing a miracle that we tune in, we press into God and allow him to speak to us. But let me tell you what's really exciting. Last week, Dimitri and Irina stood on this platform and they dedicated those two little angels, Evelyn and Victoria, to the Lord last week and we celebrate those miracle babies, amen? God's goodness. Yes, Lord. I'd like to ask our prayer team to come, if you just come quickly. And I just wanna say this, that there's some of you that are facing a Red Sea and you feel like the army, the enemy army is behind you. You feel like you're in a pickle and you, there, there's no place to go. You, you really don't know what to do. Maybe for some of you, God brought you here or God tuned you in online and, and you, you need a relationship with Jesus. You know you are dead in your sin and you need the resurrection to come and lift you out of that, bring you out of that pit. I encourage you, if that's you, if you're re online, reach out to our online pastor. If you're in this room, you reach out to the person next to you and say, hey, in a few minutes when he releases us to come pray, would you go with me? I want to know who Jesus is. I want to know who this miracle worker is. But I want to tell you, while I was sitting there, even this morning, I felt like the Lord dropped in my heart that there are some of you, whether you're watching online or in this room, that you're battling infertility. 
and you're discouraged. You feel like you're in the middle of a pickle. We don't know what to do. Man, I wanna encourage you to get prayed for today. We're gonna give God opportunity to do his work in our lives today. Maybe it's deliverance from an addiction. Maybe it's emotional healing. Maybe it's a relationship that needs restored. Maybe it's a financial miracle. I don't know what what you brought in. I do know this, you can leave it here. You can leave it here today. God wants to meet with you. The miracle worker wants to touch your life. And so I'm gonna pray and we're gonna release you to come. We're gonna lift up the name of Jesus and let him do his work. We have plenty of people here that are willing to pray for you. Don't let pride, don't let uh, an appointment afterwards, don't let lunch keep you from what God wants to do in you today. So Father, we love you. We thank you for what you're doing right now. We thank you that the waters are being stirred, God. We thank you that you're moving right now in this place and even online. And I pray, Lord God, right now that we would be receptive. We we would have that urgency to say, God, we're looking to you. We turn to you and we let you do your thing, God. And God, regardless of the circumstance we are facing, we know that there's nothing that's greater than our God. Your arm is not short. God, there's no lack in the kingdom. So meet your people today, we pray. In Jesus' name, come on. Respond to him today.